It is a distinct honor and privilege for me to be introducing our speaker this morning. We have been associated for quite a while, about probably 15 years or more, but I know very little about his profession until yesterday or the other day, I got a 37-page curriculum detail. When I think about it, I was, I'm challenged of the idea whether I preach through the curriculum vitae and give him an introduction, or I give the introduction and he preaches. This morning, allow me to summarize in a few minutes who our speaker is. Dr. Peter Landless was born and trained in South Africa. He completed his specialty in family medicine and later on his internal medicine and then cardiology. He held several posts. In 2002, he became the executive director of the International Commission for the Prevention of Alcoholism and Drug Dependency at Silver Spring, Maryland. A little later, in 2002 up to 2013, he became the Associate Health Minister's Director of the Junior Conference. From January 2006 up to February 2014, he was an adjunct professor of the Public Health, Loma Linda University School of Public Health. October 2013 to the present time, he was elected as the General Conference Health Ministry's Director. Health Ministry's Director. And 2014, February up to the present time, he's still holding as an adjunct professor of the Loma Linda University School of Public Health. Dr. Peter Landless earned three research and scholarship award. And then he has written about 20 publications in, in clinical and educational journals, cardiology, health journals in South Africa, Australia, and British journals. He was also invited to talk on various topics in conferences, particularly on heart problems, tobacco, alcohol, in many continents of the world. He chairs several boards. During the year 2013, he holds several boards, particularly in Loma Linda University. He was board of trustees at Loma Linda University, Health Sciences, Loma Linda University Medical Center Board of Trustees, Behavioral Medical Center Board, and Chair of the Quality and Safety Committee of Loma Linda Medical Center Board. To my surprise, and probably to your surprise too, she has authored and co-authored 225 articles in the Adventist World, Ministry Magazine, and in Adventist Review. He has also hosted several television shows. It's amazing. And he has written several television scripts. On a personal side, Dr. Peter Landless is a father of two grown-up girls, Bronwyn Mary and Jill Gwyneth. He's also a husband to Rosalind Lorraine Landless, who, is, who has gone through organic chemistry. Probably I would say he is my friend, someone who loves his ministry, someone to look up to. He is patient man, particularly in mentoring his colleagues. He is very supportive in the activities of his team throughout the world, throughout the division. 
He is an ordained minister. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present to you today, Dr. Peter Landquist will be speaking to you as a man of God. Dr. Landquist. Thank you so much, Pastor Carpina, whom I have learned to love since getting to know him as the Lion of the Philippines. He's been one of our most productive, energetic health ministries directors, and we thank you for your total dedication and energy committed to sharing health ministry in the last days. I wish he would listen to me because I said to him, keep it short. But he's a good friend, and that will not break the friendship. Let us pray. Gracious Father, your presence is with us. And in the urgency of this moment, May every word count, not that is mouthed by these lips of clay, but that are transformed by your Spirit into a message to your people, despite the unworthy instrument, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. What a privilege and what an honor and what a joy to be with you today. I want to thank you for the invitation. I do not take it for granted to be standing in this pulpit of this beautiful church. I wish to thank the pastor for that privilege because it is always a privilege to preach in any church. The worship experience has been wonderful. It's been reverend. It's been majestic. So thank you so much. And thank you for giving me the topic. I didn't choose it. It was chosen. Can you imagine the joy that goes through the heart of a health ministry director given the opportunity to speak on the healing ministry in the last days? You know, they say that to every man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. To a health ministry director, even the education department is an integral and complete part of health ministry. Thank you, Dr. Beardsley Hardy. I appreciate it so much. I want to bring you the greetings and the congratulations of Elder Wilson the administration of the General Conference, and also very particularly of the Education Department and the Health Ministries Department. We cherish our relationship, and we are grateful for what is happening right here. Last night, it interested me as we sat in a most exciting interview and a well-prepared one, one which preempted, which set the scene for anything I have to say. The question, why is the General Conference interested in this medical school? And of course, and I'm thankful, that the moderator said, because in the spirit of prophecy, it's written that we should be responsible. Of course, the other question that comes up, or the other answer, we need somebody to blame. We need support. We need guidance. We need to train medical ministries, missionaries, extend the healing ministry of Jesus. But I want to thank God publicly this morning for the medical students who witnessed to their faith 
right here in the Philippines, who drew the attention of a teacher whose principal behavior amongst these students awakened an interest as to why they should be that way. And through their witness, the Lord prepared a founding dean for this very school. What a blessing. What does this mean to the SSD, to the Southern Asian Division, the unions, the conferences, the churches, the church members, the students, the alumni? You know, I want to tell you and I want to share with you and I'm going to make a confession and no apology. And that is this. I feel an urgency in my ministry as I have never felt before. And that's for a number of reasons. Not least of which as I see my graying hair, what's left of it. I see the responsibility of time running by so quickly. I've been saved through the experience of landmines which exploded on a Sabbath because my mother was praying for me. I had the providential diagnosis a bad diagnosis in 2008, which lent an urgency to the need to share a message that not only is Jesus coming soon, but that each of us and that I have a very, very necessary urgency to bring to God's people and to myself. We don't have time to play games. What does it mean to this division, to the unions, to the conferences? I want to share with you that there's a medical school which is on the drawing board right now in another division. And as we sat in the advisory visit, I listened to the plan that the division has to bring every member into the involvement of founding that medical school. Every member in every union, in every church, is going to sacrifice one lunch in a year. That's $2. That's going to bring in six million US dollars in a year. And I was thrilled to hear the innovativeness because it brings in every single union in that division. And of course, the other thing is it gives every union the opportunity to send medical students to that medical school. So your challenges are just beginning. The celebration is this weekend, the joy, the culmination of what has been prepared, of the more than three, four decades of planning, of praying, of preparing, of having been refused, of now being given the go-ahead. But the travail is beginning. But God is with us. As Dr. Hadley mentioned during the Sabbath school lesson this morning, when Loma Linda was ready to be started and the instruction was given or the inspiration by Ellen White, the general conference said no. Ellen White said yes. John Burden said, I think I'd rather be on the side of the woman who is with God than on the side of the General Conference. Worried me what you said, Roger. I pray that God is with the General Conference, and I know that he is with the school. 
And I cannot and I will not forget, and I want to remind you of how excited and exciting it is for me every time I go to Loma Linda, because despite whatever they may be facing, they have been a wonderful light to this world in health, in missionary work, in ministry. And Ellen White pointed out this area, and she said when she got there, this is the very place. Right here in the Philippines, we're in another very place. We have a very special role to play, and I want to challenge each of you who are here. You know, I said I wasn't going to make an apology, and I'm going to be very direct. I'm going to be very... You know, I think the first time I visited here for the AAA, they said, you know, Dr. Landless is very hard on us. I apologize, I didn't mean to be. But what I was really saying to the AUP faculty is you are capable of excellence because God is with you. And what I want to say to you this morning is that as each one of us sits in this church this morning, we each have a responsibility for the success of this College of Medicine. You know, I have many Filipino and Filipina friends. They tell me heaven is going to be wonderful. But if you're not going to make it there, California is the second best. I want to urge you to fill this school with Seventh-day Adventist trained physicians as teachers, leaders, professors, faculty to make a university college of medicine of distinction right from where you are. How do we as health professionals serve? How do we do the healing ministry in the last days. Well, there's a role for everybody. And I was listening to some conversations even in the last 24 hours. Well, some people do their practice and some people are working within the church. Some people are teaching. Some have gone overseas. I'd like to urge each one to serve God where you are planted. And I'd like to send out a warning. And the warning is this, is that those of us who have been blessed to have a training in medicine have an opportunity to have influence, to make money, and to have a wonderful career. And one of the temptations that comes that as we do that, we then sit in the pews and we sometimes, and pastors, here's a message directly for you. Do not just embrace the physicians when you want a donation for the church building fund. Don't only know their names when you need money. Embrace them as part of your team. And physicians, don't think that your responsibility ends with the giving of an offering. Because, you know, I experienced in the very short time that I did what was called limited private practice in cardiology, I would make more money in one day of a month than I made working in the hospital in a month itself and I would put in a bigger offering. And you know, it can so readily anesthetize the senses of responsibility of my need to give myself and not just of my means. How is the healing ministry going to be done? It's going to be done not for the church. It's going to be done with the church, you've just seen time fly. It's going to be done as we, in these last days, 
move into opportunities, challenges, and the need to give ourselves to the ministry. I've heard the word sacrifice. And people say, how can you sacrifice so much and go and work for the church? Let me tell you that none of us sacrifice by working for the church. Let me tell you why. When you give and get something back, is that a sacrifice? Is it? When we return our tithe, when we give our offerings, when we are stewards and we get blessed, is that sacrifice? What is sacrifice is what Jesus did for me on the cross. He gave up his life with no guarantees of getting it back. So what I would really pray for today and for this weekend to be not just a weekend of celebration, but I'm praying that our endocrine glands will release holy adrenaline and steroids into our bloodstreams so that we will work, we will spend and be spent in the healing ministry in these last days. To understand sacrifice a little better, there's a very wonderful little story I learned as a child at my mother's knee. It's about the pig and the chicken who were walking along the country road and they saw a hungry person. And the chicken said to the pig, you know, between you and me, we could give this person a good breakfast. And the pig said, well, what are you thinking about? Well, the chicken said, bacon and eggs. And the chicken thought about it and said, no. You see the difference, or the pig thought about it and said, no. The difference, my friend, the chicken, is this. That for you to give up two eggs is a mere offering. For me to become the bacon on the plate is a complete sacrifice. So I want to ask the question, why are we doing this? Why are we establishing a medical school? I believe there are 40 medical schools in the Philippines. Is that correct? So if each one graduates, a hundred every year, 4,000. Do we need to get into the business of medical education because nobody else is doing it? Here's the next portion of my challenge to you. We are not in the business of education only. This College of Medicine is being established to be part of the healing ministry of the last days to produce medical missionaries, to produce Christian medical missionaries, to extend the healing ministry of Jesus, the right hand of the gospel, to open the door for the gospel. You know, in our... In our Scripture reading this morning. Jesus went from village to village and he healed every kind of disease. Said he had compassion on the people. That's why we do it. In Matthew 14, it goes further. It says he had compassion and he healed the sick. But in Matthew 9, he goes a little further. He said, not only did he have compassion on them, he healed them. We see that he created miracles to feed them. But then he cried out. He said, the fields are ready for harvest. Lord, send forth laborers. That is why there will be a college of medicine here at AUP. 
I see the depths of suffering in the world. As a clinician, I'll never forget one specific six-hour period. The first call went off on my pager. There was a code. I ran to the room, and there were my residents and interns, and they were busy trying to resuscitate a failed bone marrow transplant patient following chemotherapy for a terribly malignant disease, and the patient had had a stroke as well, and there the enthusiastic interns were trying to resuscitate the unresuscitatable. And we'd hardly finished sharing the bad news with the family that my pager went off again immediately, and off I went to the next emergency. A teenager, a young boy, who had had a malignancy, an osteosarcoma, had had chemotherapy and surgery successfully, but had had heart failure as a result. And here he was, cured of his cancer, in the country which started heart transplantation, waiting for a new heart. He was resuscitated, and the pager went off again, and there I went to the ICU, and there was a woman, a beautiful young woman, whose heart was being compressed by a huge amount of fluid around it, she had tuberculosis. She was HIV positive. And as I put the needle into the pericardium and watched the heart begin to fill again as that sack of fluid emptied, my eyes locked with her gaze, her beautiful brown eyes, and I saw the despair, the fear, the trauma, and the worry if she died, who was going to bring up her child? And I was moved with compassion. Why is your world church? Why is the church that I love, the church that you love, focusing on comprehensive health ministry? It's because the world, as Ellen White said, has become a Lazar house. And the time has come, and this was a call in 1902, that every member of the church, not just the general conference, not just the division, not just the union, not just the conference, but every member should lay hold on the medical missionary work in these last days. Why? Because when medical missionary work is practiced, not only by the professionals, but by the members and by each of us, it appears as if Jesus has been among people because their needs are cared for. They are loved. Their problems are attended to. They are clothed. They are dressed. The second reason that we're engaged in comprehensive health ministry is that it's not merely a method, but that it is a mission a mission where she describes and states so clearly that the mission of the gospel and the mission of healing must never be separated. Number three, it's concerned as much with wellness as with the treatment of disease. And I'm so grateful that intrinsic in the core curriculum of this new college of medicine is going to be lifestyle. Part of the Adventist health message, changing the hermeneutic or improving the hermeneutic of pharmacology and surgery and intervention to include, to be broader and have prevention right at its core. And then comprehensive health ministry is in for the long haul. We're here to do it, to do it well, and to make sure that it succeeds by God's grace. So here we are. Here we are in AUP. Here we are celebrating the be a new beginning. 1863, the first health vision, or the second one. 1865, the instruction given to Ellen White to start institutions. 1910, Loma Linda. These last days, 
We are shivering with excitement and anticipation, with not a little concern about the birth of this new school. And as Dr. Borromeo was talking yesterday, I realized that as he shared with us, that he, along with many administrators, are trusting to what God is going to do to see this work finished. We may be uncertain, but I want you to take your Bibles and come with me to John chapter 21. And John chapter 21 is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It is going to be part of our marching orders today because we see in John 21, as Jesus reveals himself the third time to his disciples, he appears to the disciples. You know, they had become discouraged. All their dreams had been shattered. Their king had been crucified. They were still wondering what was going to happen. And Peter, Peter says to the colleagues, he says, you know what? Let's go and catch some fish. He's retreating into what he knows how to do best. Peter was a fisherman. Probably a good one, a strong one, a headstrong one. And so they went out and the other disciples said, we'll come with you. And they go out and they spend an entire night. They probably spend what you may feel is equal to four decades of waiting for the College of Medicine to be approved. And early in the morning, verse 4, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Have you ever seen somebody in the distance and not recognized them? I have, and as you get closer, you suddenly realize this is who you've been wanting to meet. But they look at him, they don't recognize him, and he calls out to them. And he doesn't say, you silly, inefficient, unsuccessful fishermen, have you caught anything? How does he address them? He says, friends, friends. Have you caught anything? Haven't you any fish? No, they answered. But here he says, and I want you to remember, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. Jesus comes to these seasoned fishermen, these men who had left their nets to follow him. He comes back to them and he says to them, cast your nets on the other side and you'll find some. Have you ever been in a situation where you know exactly what to do and someone comes and tells you how to do it? And here is Jesus telling them, and when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Now there are some amazing things about this passage. Number one, it tells us that the net didn't break. Number two, it reminds us that Peter was his impetuous self. When he recognizes it's Jesus, he says to his friends, cheers, I'm out of here, I'm going to meet the Lord. Jumps out and goes. But then he goes back and helps them pull it in. And then it gives an interesting detail. It says that in the catch there were 153 large fish. Who counted them? There must have been an auditor on that ship. And then the disciples recognized him. And when they landed, they saw a fire with coals. And on the coals, there was bread and something else. What was on the fire? Fish. He didn't need their fish. He already had fish. But he gave them opportunity to be part of the ministry. And he said, bring 
what I have empowered you to do. And he said, bring some of your fish and let's have breakfast. I love that. Jesus invites them to come. Combine your efforts with my success, he says. Come and eat with me. Come and celebrate with me. My method will work. Bring your offering, small as you may think it is. I'll multiply it, he says. Bring your commitment. Start the medical school. I'll make it succeed, he says. Come and have breakfast with me, he says. Don't bring your puny offerings and think that's all that's going to work. I will take responsibility, he says. Bring it and I will multiply it. Bring it and make it part of the work. I want to share with you just very briefly to our new medical students as you come into this wonderful opportunity to study in a new school that I came from a family where no one had been to university. I had the privilege of getting a scholarship because my mother prayed I was able to share in the privilege of a career which has been dedicated to service. And when colleagues would say, how can you work for the church? God's Spirit always said to me, you can't do anything else. And that career led me through experiences of being saved from landmines because my mother was praying for me at the time, from a diagnosis of cancer because he has his providence, to become one of the physicians to the revered Nelson Mandela, to walk in the halls of presidents and heads of state. Why? Because I'm any value? No, but because he is of value. And as you come to this opportunity, as you bring your offering, as he says to you, bring your fish, bring yourselves, Take him at his word. At the end of it all, and I have a screed of quotes I could share with you, but the highest service that any of us can render is this. When men and women have formed characters which God can endorse. When their self-denial and their self-sacrifice have been fully made, when they are ready for the final test, ready to be introduced into God's family, what service will stand highest in the estimation of him who gave himself a willing offering to save a guilty race? What enterprise will be most dear to the heart of infinite love? What work will bring the greatest satisfaction and joy to the Father and to the Son? Is it walking with princes? Is it receiving medals of distinction? Is it having academic accolades? Manuscript 51 of 1901 tells us the work that will bring the greatest satisfaction and joy to the Father and Son 
is the salvation of perishing souls. And that is why the College of Medicine of Adventist University of the Philippines is being started this weekend for the salvation of perishing souls so that in this part of the world, as in other parts of the world, the work that has already been done, Pastor Carpina, the health ministries which has been taken so far, the nursing schools which have done so much can continue. The issues related to huge expos as in San Antonio and San Francisco and in Zimbabwe can be replicated all over the world as the healing ministry in these last days are reenacted from Loma Linda to AUP, from Babcock to Peru, from Montemorelos to Kigali, wherever God plants us, the rescue of perishing souls is the work he has called us to do. My prayer is that we will never lose sight of that vision, because there's coming a time and if you take that wonderful book, The Great Controversy, and you look at the last two chapters, 40 and 41, and you see how when Jesus and Adam, it says the two Adams approach each other. What an amazing scene. And Adam doesn't fall onto the breast of his Savior, onto his chest, but he casts his crown at his feet and casts himself at Jesus' feet. And we are told as we read that beautiful scene, the salvation of many souls is the result and the cause of the celebration on that day. May the Lord bless each one of you. May he bless this division. May he bless this great school, its leadership, and each one who participates in it. And every student, you enter into a portal of service. from which you never graduate. May God bless you and keep you to that end is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. It's now time for our to worship him through giving. What do you see when you come to the church? I suppose that it all depends on where you are looking. Ellen G. White, while living in Australia, would make a point of looking out for any sister at church who was poorly dressed. After the services, Ellen White would speak to the woman and invite her to her home during the week. Ellen White was a great Bergen, Bergen hunter, and when she found a good woolen fabric at wholesale prices, she would bring it home and lay it away in a drawer in her room. Then, when the poor sister came to visit, she would tactfully say to her, I have a nice piece of material that I think would be very becoming to you. If you have no objections, I should like to have my seamstress make it up for you. Many a sister went away from Ellen's home surprised and happy to have been noticed. Today, brothers and sisters, let us become aware of the needs that surround us and be motivated to give generously for the salvation of the perishing souls. Our deacons and deaconesses are ready to serve us as they receive the tithes and offerings. 